Exodus chapter 2, verses 7 through 10, you will find these words. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, because I drew him out of the water. I got a simple subject for you today. I want you to look at your neighbor, and I want you to say, neighbor... Be sure those you love know God. Be sure those you love know God. Hallelujah. On Mother's Day, even though our mothers, many of them have gone to be with the Lord, they made sure, they made sure because they loved us that we knew God. So turn your name again and say, be sure those you love No God. Let's give him one more praise. One more praise. For those of you that are connected with our text messaging network, and if you're not, it's in your bulletin. We'd like for you to sign up. Um, We'd like for you to get on the grid. Yesterday, uh, you received a message from me about successful mothers that went something like this. Successful mothers are not the ones that have never struggled They are the ones that never give up despite the struggles. And I ended by saying, when we worship him today, let's thank him for the mothers he placed in our lives that have never given up. That have never given up. Brothers and sisters, when we consider the story of Moses, clearly he became the kind of man he was because of the type of mothers he had. Somebody say mothers. Mothers he had. You see, according to scripture, Moses had two mothers, and both of his mothers loved him. Now, that's a blessing because not everybody has that testimony. And we can have a number of mothers in our lives, and I'm not saying they didn't do a good job. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Somebody did something somewhere because you're here. Somebody blessed you in some way because you made it. Amen. But not every mother loves being a mother. The story is told of a woman who was shopping for swimsuits with her mother. After trying on several that didn't fit, she grew increasingly frustrated. You know what happens when you have a child, you put on a pound here and a pound there, and you try to get in your regular stuff, and it doesn't always work. Amen? So trying to calm her down, her mother said to her, she says, look, baby, look at it this way. What would you rather have? The husband and three children who adore you or a swimsuit that fits? Before she could answer the question, a faceless voice from the next dressing room shouted, I want a swimsuit that fits. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, not every woman wants kids. But these two women did. And so to have two mothers that that loved him was no small thing in that day because Moses was born, watch this, in a culture of death. He was born in a culture of death. You see, a decree had gone out from the throne of Pharaoh that every male child born to a Hebrew mother should be killed. Look at Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. The Bible says, and the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shifra and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. I love the next verse. The scripture says, but the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men, children, alive. There are a lot of men here today, brothers and sisters, that had it not been for a mother loving us, 
we would not be here. If it had not been for somebody looking out for us, opening a door for us, creating an opportunity for us, we would not be here. We have all sinned and all come short of the glory of God. But if someone had not loved us and forgiven us, we would not have made it. And so when the midwives wouldn't do it, in verse number 22 of Exodus 1, Pharaoh charged all his people saying, every son that is born, ye shall cast him into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Are you all praying with me? This is a culture of death. This is a terrible time. We live in America. We live in, in Champaign, Illinois. It is a wonderful community. America is viewed as the land of the free and the home of the brave. It is a wonderful place in which to live. If you ever get an opportunity to travel somewhere outside of the United States to a third world country, you'll get a real appreciation of how God has dropped you right smack dab into the middle of a blessing. The first thing we want to recognize is that the birth mother of Moses loved him. The birth mother of Moses loved him. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, And there went a man of the house of Levi, and he took a wife of the daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw that he was a goodly child, I guess you could almost say he was a godly child, she hid him three months. Now, according to Exodus chapter 6, verse 20, this woman's name is Jochebed. She could have, watch this, given him away. According to the law, she should have given away or thrown him away, but she didn't. She chose life for Moses instead of death. Every time I, I, I think about my mom, I think about she could have thrown me away. She could have gotten rid of me. Are, are you with me? And, and especially everyone that is born um, from the 70s and beyond, it is just the grace of God and the love of your mother that you are here. And I don't know what she did or she didn't do, but I do know this. She got you here. For Jochebed, it required her to hide her child for three months, always fearing that the Egyptian soldiers would discover her baby. And not only would they kill her if they found the baby, kill the baby, not only would they kill the baby, but they would punish or even kill the entire family for not killing the baby. But she hid him anyway. You know why? Because she loved him. Because she loved him. I want you to say, I want you to understand this here. If your mother carried you, you may not even know her. You may have no contact with her. May not even know her name. But if she carried you, there was something precious about you that made her go through what she went through to get you here. And so don't you ever, ever not give God praise for the mother that he placed in your life. The adopted mother of Moses loved him. Look at Exodus chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. And when she, referring to Jochebed, could no longer hide him. She took him for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child in and she laid it in the flags by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to watch, to wit, to watch what would be done to him. Now watch this. She puts him in a place and, and his sister is standing there to watch what happens to my brother. I don't want him to go, but I, I know he's got to go because we can't keep him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, verse number five, and her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him. One version says her heart went out to him. And she said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Pharaoh's daughter found him and instantly had compassion on him or loved him. And watch this. She decided, I'm going to keep him. She knew who the baby was. She knew he was a Hebrew. Her father had decreed that these children, these Hebrew male children should die. Her society had decided that these Hebrew babies should die. Egyptian wisdom had determined that the Hebrew male children were a threat to their nation. It would have been so easy to let him die. But she decided this boy is going to live 
and not die. I am so glad that God put people in our lives that made the decision they will live and not die. Can I get somebody to help me praise him? Egyptian wisdom said, let him die. But she said, no, he's going he's gonna to live. It would have been too easy. Both mothers lived in a culture of death. Both mo mothers lived in a society that had decreed certain children should die. But Moses lived because Jochebed and Pharaoh's daughter never, ever accepted that culture. They each loved him and chose life for him over death. Turn to somebody and say, I'm so glad I'm here. Mm -hmm. Next time you wonder about what's going on in your life, why things are going so rough, you ought to just lift your hands up to glory. Say, God, I just want to thank you. I'm here. I'm here for the experience. And so Moses lived and, and became the kind of man he was because his two mothers loved him. Number three, the mothers of Moses did all they could for him. They did all they could for him. Look at Jochebed. Exodus chapter 2, verse 2. And the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Jochebed gave birth to Moses and then hid him in order to save him. But she never knew. She knew that that could not last forever. Amen. The question is, what did you do to, uh, what sacrifices have you made for your child? When I read this here, my, my mind goes back and I start thinking, man, what must it have been like for her to, her to have to hide her own baby? And babies like to cry and try to keep that baby from crying so that folks wouldn't know that that baby was alive. Because if they knew that baby was alive, somebody was going to tell and that baby was going to die. Now watch this. She says this here. She says, what do I have to do to keep my boy alive? She gave birth to him, and then she hid him in order to save him. Now, watch her, watch her next move. Watch, what am I going to do? You ever been in a position like that with your child? I want you to think about it for a moment. Yeah. Watch this. Now, what am I going to do? He's counting on. She's counting on you. I'm talking to mothers right now who may have felt like you didn't have the support you needed always. Now what am I going to do? I can't talk to him because he can't see what I see. Watch this. I'm a dad, but I can't feel what she feels. Do you understand what I'm saying? I can't, I can't talk to him because he cannot relate to what I'm going through. What? Now, what now can I, can I do? Where can I go? What's going to be my next move? How, is, how can I continue to cover my baby so that my baby can live? Well, she got creative. If Pharaoh wanted her child to be thrown in the river, she started thinking, that's where I'm going to put him. I'm going to put him in the river. But I'm going to give him fighting chance to live. That's all you can do for your baby is give him a fighting chance. So she got him a basket. At one point I said she and her husband built a basket. But that's taking scripture too far. That's not what the scripture says. Scripture says she got a basket. I don't know where she got the basket from. I don't know how she did what she had to do. But I do know this one thing. Are you all listening to me? I do know this one thing. She made sure that she had something for her baby. She got him a basket and covered it with pitch so it would flow. And she places the basket in the bulrushes or a grass-like area common to wetland along the shore of the Nile. She doesn't put him out in the current where he could be swept downstream. She likely scouted around for the best place to put the basket. I'm not just going to put the basket anywhere. I got a plan. God has given me a plan. I'm going to work the plan. Because she put the basket in a sheltered place, a place where the basket could be found. Are you all praying with me right now? 
Some of you have been very creative. You've been so creative and done so many wonderful things, you don't even remember what you've done. If he's going to be found, this is what she's thinking in her heart, I want him to be found by someone who has power and influence to make sure they don't kill him. Where she puts him has to be strategic. And the only person with that kind of influence, it has to be Pharaoh's daughter. God told me, put him where Pharaoh's daughter can find him. Jacobad had done an awful lot of planning and praying to make sure her child survived. Now let's look at Pharaoh's daughter. See, now we see Pharaoh's daughter, Moses' adopted mother. Somebody say Moses' adopted mother. Could have been his foster mother. Could have, been, could have been his spiritual mother. He has another mother. And the scripture says she loves this boy. According to our text, the daughter of Pharaoh gets the sister of Moses to get a nanny to take care of the baby she just found by the name of Moses. She hasn't even named him yet, but she found him. Look at verse number 7, Exodus 2, 7. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may be nurse, that she may nurse the child for thee? You know what I like? I like, I like women that are bold. This is an age where women were supposed to be seen and not heard. Anybody's ever read the Bible, you know women didn't have a whole lot of leverage during this time. But this girl, the daughter, Miriam, she not only watches where her mother puts the baby, she watches the baby after her mother puts the baby there. And then she watches Pharaoh's daughter find the baby. She knows Pharaoh's daughter doesn't know anything about taking care of a baby. So what does she do? She boldly goes to Pharaoh's daughter and say, I think you know who this baby is. This is a Hebrew baby. Do you want me to get a Hebrew nanny to take care of this Hebrew baby? And Pharaoh's daughter says, you're right. I, my heart is connected to the baby, but I don't know how to take care of baby. So get me somebody that can take care of the baby. So the daughter, the sister, Miriam, goes home and say, Mama, look at God. Pharaoh's daughter just found my brother. And you know what? She needs a nanny to take care of him. And mama, I don't think nobody could take care of him the way you could take care of him. Let's go get him. Isn't that tight? Isn't that tight? And the scripture says she got her and she, and she brought her back. And Pharaoh's daughter in verse number, number nine, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I will give thee thy wages and the woman took the child and, and nursed it or she took care of the child and fed it and I believe not only naturally but spiritually she knew her time was limited but while she had the chance I want to make sure that I know that I know that I know that I know he knows God and that God is his source and watch this. God is so good, says, because your heart is so right, I'm going to put you in a position to take care of your own child, and I'm going to have Pharaoh's daughter pay you to do it. When a man or a woman's ways please the Lord, he'll make your enemies to be at peace with you. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 10, once he was weaned or had grown, Jochebed takes Moses to Pharaoh's daughter. She then takes him into her home and makes him her son. Like Jochebed, Pharaoh's daughter did everything she could for his well-being. Acts chapter 7, verse 22 in the New International Version, this is what you will find. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and actions. She did everything she could to make sure he was ready. Pharaoh's daughter wanted Moses to have all the advantages that her culture could supply. 
She wanted him to be more than a common laborer. She wanted him to be a leader of men and a ruler of nations. She did everything in her power to give him an edge and advantage, fitting for the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Both of Moses' mothers loved him, and they did everything they could so that he could be everything that God had ordained him to be. But Jochebed, Jochebed gave Moses the one thing that changed his life. Somebody shout glory. When I think about my mother, the one thing I know, she gave me what was necessary to change my life. Mm, mm, mm. Pharaoh's daughter supplied Moses a knowledge of the wisdom of Egypt. Listen to me carefully. She got him into the best schools. She found him the best teachers. She gave him all the tools he needed to be a man of power in wisdom, in speech, and action. She groomed him for success. Are you all listening to me? He's going to be the very best, watch this, that money and culture can buy. I want to go to point number four, because Moses ultimately chooses the people of God over being Pharaoh's daughter over being Pharaoh's daughter's son. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, 24 tells us, Hebrews eleven twenty four 24, tells us that by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That's a powerful thing right there. This is a thing that I got to always be mindful of. Because, because, see, there's an interesting thing in life. When, when you're blessed, when you're blessed, if you don't mess it up, you'll continue to be blessed. If, 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 you, don't, if you don't get the big head, you'll, you'll continue to be blessed. And, and, and I remember when I was ordained, I had an afro back then. I, I really did. I know it's hard to believe right now, but I, but I did. And, and I remember I was, a, I was just a young man. And I remember my pastor, uh, Bishop Haynes, he gave me one word of instruction on my ordination. And this is the one thing he said. He said, son, always wear the same size hat. That's all he said. I think he could see something that could possibly take me somewhere that he knew I didn't need to go. And, 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 and if he can see me today, uh, I, I want him to know, Bishop, I, I'm still wearing the same size hat. Yeah, my head is still the same size. I haven't grown beyond where I was when you found me. Hallelujah. He is still my God and my, and my source. Somebody shout hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, we may not be what we ought to be. We may not be what we're going to be. But let's give him praise. We're not what we used to be. sanctified soul. With everything that Pharaoh's daughter had done for him, he realized there was one thing she couldn't supply. I appreciate you, Mom. I thank you for everything that you've done. But something that you've given me is not adequate. Something was missing from the extensive education of the universities of Egypt. You might ask, what could that be? With all that training, with all those resources and great teachers, what on earth could be missing? What could this powerful and, and world-dominant Egyptian society not supply? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question because I got an answer for you. Remember, the Bible says that Jochebed nursed him. I like that. Jochebed nursed him. We got a lot of mothers and a lot of babies in our ministry today. Boy, and they're coming in leaps and bounds, and I'm giving God praise for every one of them. Because God is showing us where he's taking us. Are you listening to me? God is saying to us, I, I have not forgotten you. I, I've got a plan and a purpose for you. And, and, and I'm encouraging mothers right now, nurse your baby. Nurse your baby. I know that the society has a lot to offer them, but I'm telling you right now, any baby can get what society has to offer. 
But only certain babies are going to be made to know God. Oh, yeah. You got you to gotta listen to me right now. Jochebed nursed Moses. She gave Moses something that Pharaoh's daughter didn't have, and that was the knowledge of God. Are you all praying with me in the name of Jesus? She, Listen, brothers and sisters, as parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles, we need to realize that even in the most, with the most advanced education our society can supply, without God at the center of our children's lives, there will be an emptiness that nothing but nothing but nothing but nothing can fill. Oh, God, help me get this out. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon, who is clearly one of the richest, wisest, and most powerful kings the world has ever known, looks at the many advantages a man can have in this life. He had health and wealth and education and power and success. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 8, in the New International Version, in a semi-state of depression, Solomon says, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. Everything is meaningless. You see, Solomon had learned all my life I thought it was money. But there are things money can't buy. It has been said money can buy flattery but not respect. Money can buy companions but not friends. Money can buy amusement but not happiness. Money can buy luxuries but not culture. It can buy medicine but not health. It can buy food but not an appetite. Money can buy your books but not brains. It can buy your sex but not love. It can buy your bed but not sleep. It can buy you an earthly house but not a heavenly home. Solomon, as rich as he is, as powerful and as successful as he is, he realized that fame and fortune alone is empty and meaningless without knowing God and obeying God. Listen to what he says just a few verses later in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of a whole matter. You want to live well? Fear God. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Solomon wanted us to know without God, life is meaningless and, and empty. Only God can help us reach our potential. Only God can make clear to us his promises and reveal his possibilities. Once we know God and obey God, then and only then do we realize that we've been made in the image and likeness of God. Turn to somebody and say, I'm made like God. We are part of his plan. We have been created for his purpose. Jochebed wanted Moses to know he is wise, son. I know you're young, but I want you to remember the words of mama. He is why you exist. She wanted him to know you are God's child. Jacobet knew that there were times would come when Moses would, would need somebody to love him and nobody physically would be there. So she wanted him to know that when you feel that nobody loves you, Yahweh loves you. And he will never, ever, never leave you. And that's the reason why our children and our grandchildren and our nieces and our nephews need to know him. You see, there are going to be times, I don't care how you love them and how you try to protect them and how you look out for them, there are going to be times when our, those that we love won't feel so loved. They won't feel so worthy. They won't feel so needed. And they need to know that God is with them. And that he will never, never, ever leave them alone. The question was, was asked to moms, why do you love your newborn child? Why do you, new, do you love your newborn child? For months the baby has brought you nothing but pain. They made you break out in pimples and waddle like a duck. Because of them you crave sardines and crackers and threw up in the morning. They kicked you in your stomach. The child occupied a space that wasn't theirs and ate food they didn't fix. You kept them warm. You kept them safe. You kept them fed. But did the child ever say thank you? Are you kidding? As soon as they came out the womb, they started crying. The room is too cold. The blanket is too rough. The nurse is too mean. And, but who does the child want? The child wants mom. Don't you, don't you get a break, mom? 
I mean, you've been doing the work for the last nine months. Why can't the dad take over? But no, not a chance. Dad just won't do. The baby wants mom. The baby didn't even tell you when she was coming. She just came. And what a coming she came with. She turned you into a barbarian. You screamed, you cried, you tore the sheets. And now look at you. Your back aches, your head pounds, your body is drenched in sweat. Every muscle is strained and stretched. You should be angry, but guess what? You're not. Not a chance because when I look at your face, I see this on your face. Looking at the baby, you're saying, I will love you forever. Can I get somebody to help me in this place? That baby has done nothing for you, and yet you love that baby. That baby's brought pain to your body and nausea to your morning, yet you treasure that baby. Their faces are wrinkled and their eyes are dim, yet all you can do is talk about how good they look and how bright their future is. She's going to wake you up every night for the next six weeks, but that's okay because you're crazy about her. You're crazy about him. Why? Why does a mother love her newborn? Because the baby is hers. Even more, the baby is her. Her blood, her flesh, her hope, her legacy. It bothers her not that the baby gives nothing. She knows that the baby is helpless and weak. She knows that the baby didn't ask to come into this world. But watch this. But I'm so glad that you're here. And the Lord showed me this. God knows, just like the mother, that we're here not because we asked to come here. He knows we didn't ask to come here. But watch this. We're his. We are his idea. We are his face. We are his eyes, his hands, his touch, his workmanship, his offsprings. Brothers and sisters, don't you tell anybody, or maybe you should. We are his. We are him. And it doesn't matter what you have accomplished or have not accomplished. Without him, we are all empty and meaningless. And so today, as we celebrate Mother's Day, I say to you this one thing. Make sure that those you love know God. For it is in him that we live and move and have our being. And without God, there's just really nothing but nothing but nothing that we can do. Give him praise. Give him glory. Give him honor in the house of God today.